Emeline has just told me is the <laughs> Emerald City. Emerald City. I think last time I checked. Which we've decided sounds like a Pokemon <laughs> expansion <laughs> <Yes>. region. <laughs> Emerald edition. Thank you so much for joining us for the Monday morning class. My mm -hmm. name is Julian. I teach a weekly introduction to philosophy and theory class here on Instagram Live as well as on YouTube. Hello to people on YouTube. <laughs> I am joined by Jen Lee, Good who, morning. Who edits these texts and turns them into transcripts yeah. and ebooks. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much for doing that and mm -hmm. for yeah, you betcha. being here with me, <laughs> editor in chief, personal living in editor. I like this. Um, if you're joining us for the very first time, um, about a year ago, two years ago, we started hosting these live classes for free, open access on the internet, because we believe that education wants to be free and that everybody, no matter where you are, should be able to access the idea of what philosophy is, what theory is, what continental theory is, what Zizek's ideas are, Hegel's mm -hmm. ideas, Kant's ideas, Lacan's ideas, etc. Mm -hmm. And to hopefully do that in a way that feels interesting, entertaining, that doesn't feel like we've dumbed it down too much, to keep up a level of complexity mm. without losing the enjoyment of it. So if you're joining us, no matter where you're joining us from, we very much hope that you will let us know where you're joining us from. I see someone has already said that they're joining for the first time, so welcome. There is no perfect place to start. Wherever you are is the right place to, to start. So. That's right. It would make us very happy if you leave us a comment telling us where you're joining us from. Um, the absolute best thing about doing this is that we get to know that we're sharing a digital space mm -hmm. with all of you guys around mm -hmm. the world. It makes us yeah. so happy. We're, we're traveling quite a bit and hosting these classes from different cities across the U.S. and pretty soon across Europe as well. And today we are in Seattle. Greetings to people from California, Belgium, mm -hmm. Colombia. That's amazing. Lebanon. That's yeah. fantastic. <laughs> Thank you so much for your comics, guys. Indonesia. Yeah. Yeah. And we are in Seattle. Yes. Okay, so uh, today, if you're joining us for the first time, you can jump right in. You don't have to have any previous knowledge. However, if you'd like to catch up on these classes... I very much recommend that you read um, my ebook. My ebook is available on Patreon, exclusively on Patreon. It's called The Vanishing Mediator, and it's essentially a 90 page summary of the previous lecture series, the previous 12 weeks. So, if you'd like to catch up with where we are with this lecture series, I'd very much recommend that you consider purchasing the ebook. And of course, you can also download all of the classes as a podcast on Patreon. That's also how we finance this project, and it's how we keep it free for everybody else. Mm -hmm. So a very big thank you to our worldwide community of patrons who keep this project on the road mm -hmm. and who make it free for everybody else. Yeah. We, we're so grateful, and we love the fact that we're trying to prove that open access education can actually have a financial model that works. So on behalf of everybody who gets to enjoy these classes, mm -hmm. on behalf of us who are enjoying teaching these classes... Thank you to our patrons. <laughs> and if you'd like to become a patron, just click the link in our bio or our about page. I think that's... Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so we're going to jump right in. Um, I want to talk about a whole bunch of stuff today. We're going to not make it too <laughs> difficult. I want to talk about a, a Hegelian idea that seems very abstract, but we're going to find a lot of ways to talk about it, which is that for Hegel, a, an idea or a concept finds its true form in it's perceived opposite. Mm. Or actually what Hegel calls it a notion finds its true form and its opposite. For example, here's a political example of this. Do you know how a lot of places that are supposed to be non-political have become the most political places? For example, like... Sports arena. Exactly, a sports arena, like a, like a soccer stadium mm -hmm. or, or in the United States, uh, you know, American football. It's exactly those places that we think of as being apolitical that have become the most politicized. And that's essentially like a political example of what Hegel means, is that the true nature of politics emerges precisely in the places where you wouldn't find it. But there's many different ways in which you could apply that idea that Hegel has. For example, um, there's an actor who once said that what's really impactful if you're watching good acting, this is like our pre-Oscars <laughs> prediction, what's really good when you're watching good acting isn't the ability to cry. It's not actually watching somebody cry. In fact, watching somebody cry is slightly pathological. In part, this is also why when we see men cry because of the performative mm. gender nuances of what we expect to be quote-unquote masculinity, we find it almost comical when men cry. Mm -hmm. 
However, what's really impactful is when we see somebody not crying, but holding back tears. In other words, the essence of grief emerges not in the act of crying. Uh oh. Uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> We're near the fire department. Yeah, there's a there's a fire truck coming by. Okay. Very dramatic. <laughs> the essence of grief mm-hmm. emerges not in the act of crying, which would be almost an outburst, the breaking of the dams, an excessive pathological emoting, mm-hmm. but that the essence of crying emerges precisely in holding back tears. Yeah. And so if you want to convey grief on camera, you hold back your tears. And what we enjoy yeah. is the struggle. And Very this good is, acting is about trying to repress the emotion rather than just directly channeling the emotion. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And this is actually where, like, when it comes to method acting, one of the weaknesses of method acting, to my mind, is that method acting believes that if you tap into the urgrund, the original trauma of your own life, you can then find that trauma accurately in your depiction of it. And the point for me is that where method acting falls short is it sees a direct overlap between the idea of your originating trauma and the portrayal of it. Whereas what we're interested in is the repression of the emotion, not the display of the emotion as such. By the way, Jenlene and I went to see The Godfather, remastered last week. Mm -hmm. And did you know, Godfather trivia, that the originator, I forget what his name is, the founder of the Method Acting School has a cameo. Really? And I believe it's the man who opens the movie bringing the petition to The Godfather... Who is who's the the um, the mortician? Yeah, the, the mortician who is oh. going through a range of like five or six emotions, like <laughs> anger and sadness and happiness, and it's like a display of method acting <laughs> homage. Such okay, a great opening. Yeah. but something <laughs> similar when you think about crying. So if you think about crying as what's really impactful is watching somebody hold back tears. Something similar is true for romanticism. Romanticism within music, romanticism with art. Now, today we have this very almost negative attitude towards romantic music, rom- romanticism, that it's simply nice melodies and things that sound nice. But the opposite is true. The true core of romanticism isn't the portrayal of lyric emotion. It's precisely the struggle to portray, portray it. This is why, for example, even though a pianist like Satie wouldn't be considered necessarily a romantic, we see within Satie the way in which romanticism becomes modernism. Mm. In other words, modernism is not the opposite of romanticism. Modernism is the extrapolation of the internal limit within romanticism. Now, what do I mean by that? Romanticism isn't about saying, here's a romantic tune. Romanticism is saying, here's how I'm holding back the flood of emotion. The most famous example of this is if you go to Um, uh, Wagner's finale for Tristan and Isolde, Liebestod, the love death. Mm -hmm. And what happens is that in the swell, one of the most powerful pieces of music ever arranged, um, in the swelling of the motif, it actually starts and it gets caught back in. And then it starts again and it's interrupted. There's, sorry to be so crude, but there's like a cock block moment, <laughs> literally on the page when it comes to Tristan and Isolde consummating their love. And what's jarring about it and what's so beautiful about it is that when finally the motif comes out, mm-hmm. we're hit with this incredible bursting of the dams of emotion. It's impossible not to cry if you listen to Liebestod. I once, when I used to work as a professor at Oxford Brooks, they were going to do a rendition of mm. Liebestod and some other things in the Oxford, I forget what it was, camera, I think. Mm-hmm. And, and I went up to my students and I said, anybody who wants to go to this thing, I will buy you tickets. <laughs> I will take you. And it was, of course, this is a weird thing for a professor to say to a student. And so nobody wanted to go. And I ended up going by myself and sitting in the very front row. And if you're in the very front row, it just reverberates mm. through you. And here's a very nice vindictive moment for me. Mm-hmm. One of our students, who also watches these classes, uh, two years later, uh, approached me online and said, ever since you invited me to come to this concert, I wish that I would have done it. And I thought that was so sweet. Yeah. Anyway, so the Liebestod has this... Go to concerts. Yeah. I mean, you can find this online as well. Yes. It's that that pushing the emotion to its extreme, Mm -hmm. but also holding back. And so the release is emotional, but really what the romantic core of it is, is the buildup 
that doesn't find a release. This is part of the innovation of classical music in the transition from classical to romantic. So from classical characterized by, let's say, um, Mozart and Bach to classical music characterized by, let's say, Brahms and Beethoven is how they use progression to create, to build tension without resolving the tension in a harmonic structure. Right. Yeah, no, it's actually a really nice addition yeah. because we didn't do classical romantic. It's very good. <laughs> and Jenlene is actually a musician, by the way. I cannot play to save my life. <laughs> no. Jenlene can actually play music. Um, so my, my point originally, if you remember, was that modernism is usually perceived of as a radical break with romanticism. Mm-hmm. As in, oh, here we have beautiful lyrical romantic music, <laughs> and now we have the atonal symphonies of Schoenberg, where it's like, burr, 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 burr. like, you know what I mean? It's like going from, um, I don't know, from Britney Spears to death metal. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? That's yeah. how it's usually presented. Mm-hmm. But the argument, and the argument that Hegel would make, and Hegel does write about music, is that it's precisely from within the contradictions within Romanticism that modernism comes out. In other words, if the core of Romanticism is the idea of an internal struggle, the struggle to withhold emotion or to withhold the fulfillment of a melody, Mm -hmm. that modernism simply takes that element and raises it to its own universal content. Mm -hmm. In other words, if a particular feature of Romantic music is this, this haphazard struggle, Modernism simply says we're going to take that element and make this the music itself. Right. <clears throat> struggle, struggle becomes the content in, in a sense. Mm-hmm. And so what's really important to note here is that, again, we have something that seems to be the opposite that becomes the completion of the form itself. Right. And so the progress from Romanticism to Modernism isn't we have something which contradicts that which came before it. In other words, we don't simply have a sequence by which we have a positive entity that is negated into its opposite. It's not saying that the avant-garde in that sense is simply trying to do the opposite of what came before. It's about taking the internal limit of what came before and then stretching that to its logical conclusion, which is its own form of contradiction. Now, what's important here from a Hegelian perspective, I think there's also going to be... I don't know if we can catch <laughs> yeah, it on coming camera. up from behind us. We'll no, it's coming camera. up from oh, behind, behind us. us. Yes, it's like flashing lights. <laughs> in great. case you haven't seen a fire engine. We're actually like four-year-olds. We're we really got... excited to see a fire engine. <laughs> I have a story about this, which is that... Um, there's a fire station here, yeah. and they they can crack open the front of the engine, mm-hmm. and um, to like polish it and whatever. And I wanted to take some photographs of it, so I walked up to it to start taking photographs. And they all looked at me like I was some kind of like Soviet spy <laughs> or something. And I looked at them and I said, "I'm not a spy. I'm just a ten year old boy in man's in, in, in a man's body." Okay, so <clears throat> the point here is that the contradiction isn't between things. It's not saying that we have yin yang, we have one versus the other. It's not a pure rejection of one kind of form. And that's always the temptation to say modernist music is to say, let's make something that's intentionally ugly. We're we're tired of things being beautiful. We want something that sounds really ugly. That's not what modernist um, modernist music is. Right. Yes, true. I, I mean sometimes it seems that way. Well, I mean, I don't want to make a normative argument yeah, yeah. about beauty and not beauty, but yeah. we we could if you wanted to. Um So what I want to talk about is this relationship where contradiction exists within the thing itself instead of between two things. And there's actually a beautiful, there's a beautiful scene in a television series that I was watching recently called Treme, Hmm. in which we have a young couple, a man and a woman, who are walking through a park in New York. They're on a date. It's a romantic scene. And they're playing a game in which both of them have to choose an exception. In other words, in their relationship, as it is Mm. being negotiated, they have to choose one person (laughs) that if they met that person, they would be allowed to cheat. For example, for the guy, it's Beyonce. If he meets Beyonce, he'd be allowed to cheat on Beyonce. And the woman says, okay, that's your exception. My exception is, and then she mentions like some 70 year old jazz singer. And he's like, what? You want the 70 year old jazz singer? And she says, well, I just have my type. <laughs> that evening, they go to a party, which is like, you know, a New York gathering of intellectuals, salon, etc. And all of a sudden, who emerges? It's precisely the 70 year old man jazz singer. <laughs> and suddenly the man is like, oh no, my wife's, my, my wife to be, my, my partner, my date has found her exception, and now she can cheat. But of course, it's exactly in the moment that this comes to fruition, that Mm -hmm. it clicks, 
that we realize that the joke was on him. She already knew that this old man would be at the party. And so she was setting her date up, as in she would actually meet her exception. Now, what's crucial about this scene is that the entire game of who is your exception, who is the person you would Mm -hmm. cheat on me with and you would be sanctioned to do it, is predicated on the idea that you will never meet that person. That's the whole point. (laughs) And so again, we have here the Hegelian idea that the notion is essentialized in its opposite. In other words, instead of talking about true love, I love you so much, we're going to be together forever, I never want to be with somebody else ever again, instead of talking about that, you're talking about what seems to be the opposite, which is, here is a negotiation of the person I would cheat on you with. Mm -hmm. So how is it that the romantic gesture becomes, here's the person I would want to cheat on you with? Mm -hmm. And that's exactly the Hegelian idea that you end up with the notion in its opposite form, which is, instead of talking about love, an sich, we're talking about who I would cheat with, and yet who I expect never to meet, as a way of talking about how much I love you. And it's that circum motion that essentially is in that scene. Yeah. Which is so... Yeah, sorry, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. That reinforces how strong the love is. Yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. And, and there's so many ways in which, in which this works. Um, this is what Lacan, but Chizik actually has this in one of his book titles. This is what Lacan calls the universal exception. And so one of the ideas that Lacan has is that the symbolic order isn't complete. In fact, it's completely incomplete. That the only thing that is actually universal in the symbolic order is its very incompleteness. And that everything, whether it's the expression of love, whether it's the expression of, I don't know, uh, loyalty or kind of some kind of affinity, uh, affinity towards the big other, is always expressed by means of this sort of opposite. Let me give you an example of this. An example that everybody will understand. Think about apologies. Think about when you receive or demand an apology from somebody. The most common response, if somebody gives you an apology, is for you to say, oh, it was nothing. You don't have to apologize. In other words, that you're essentially retroactively pretending like they didn't need to apologize. Of course, if at that point, the person would say, oh, Actually, then I retract my apology. (laughs) Exactly. Oh, well, if I didn't need to apologize, I retract my apology. That would also cause offense. Mm -hmm. And so what the apology does, where the apology functions, is that the manner by which you make up, the manner by which you both save face and engage in a symbolic exchange within Mm -hmm. the symbolic order, isn't to say, let's have an exact retribution for who did what to whom, and I will do it back to you, but rather it's the performative practice of someone saying, I'm sorry I did this, and then you say, well, you shouldn't be sorry, and then they say, well, I'm sorry anyway. Mm -hmm. That's, again, the essence of the thing emerges in its perceived opposite notion, or what Lacan calls the universal exception, that what keeps the symbolic order together isn't a kind of, like, completeness within itself, a a, a sort of, like, auto-identity. Instead, it's precisely the idea that it's the break within the symbolic order that stitches it back together. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, what happens, and this is something that happened in my own life recently, is I was bitten by a dog. Mm. Someone who's a dog owner, their dog um, bit me accidentally, whatever. We can't attribute a tent to a dog. And what's interesting is that I was upset about this, Mm -hmm. and I wanted that person to apologize, which they didn't. And so what made me upset wasn't being bit by the dog. What made me upset was that the other person didn't think it was a problem. And so we have here a misperception, which is I see this as a problem and they don't see it as a problem. Now, ironically, let's say that I'm bitten by the dog and the owner says, oh, I'm so sorry that happened to you. Then my instinct would be to say, oh, no, no, it's nothing. It's not your fault. It was the dog's fault. It's not the dog's fault. And, And... So what what was funny was that eventually the owner did apologize Mm -hmm. to me and I went one step further because the true sign of power is precisely the power of being able to debase yourself. In other words, not only did I say, oh no, it wasn't you and it wasn't the dog. I said something like, it was my fault all along. I shouldn't have presented my juicy leg to your dog. It was too much of a temptation. We cannot blame the dog. You know what I mean? Like, this is ultimately what it means to properly have 
We have to complete the circuit of... Exactly. And so what becomes consensus isn't so much I've paid my dues, I've apologized, everything is right. It's that retroactive strangeness by which now I profess to have been the cause of the problem all along Mm -hmm. as a way to then create the space for the other person to coexist. Mm -hmm. And this is also like... This is this actually relates to Zizek's theory of freedom. So Zizek has an interesting theory of freedom. Zizek says that freedom is, I want to say this right, freedom is contingency experienced as necessity. Or you could also say freedom, authentic freedom, is um, contingency presented as necessity. Mm-hmm. Now, let me give you an example of this because it's abstract. Zizek says, what if... You're in the street. Actually, he doesn't say this. This is my example of it. You're in the street, and somebody passes out. And everybody just walks by. And you think, why is everybody walking by? And then you decide to do something and actually call an ambulance for that person. Mm -hmm. If later the local journalist shows up and says, here we have this local hero, this person, the civic-minded individual. Why did you choose to to intervene when everybody just walked by? Well, my response would be, I didn't have a choice. In other words, the genuine authentic act of freedom, which is to not walk by, to take action, to help somebody, would retroactively be presented as, well, I didn't have a choice. And this isn't just false modesty. This isn't saying, well, I had to. It's actually saying that genuine authentic freedom only presents itself as the appearance of necessity. Well, I had to do it. And this is actually the problem that we see within the Kantian imperative and within the Kantian idea of du kannst denn du sollst. That we don't have freedom versus obligation. Instead, we have freedom presenting itself as the necessity, the obligation to act. Mm -hmm. I had no choice, which is why I had to act. In other words, the very idea that I had, I mean, this is me as a heroic fantasy, Mm -hmm. right? But the very reason that I have no choice to intervene isn't because I see the person in need. It's because I identify everybody else walking by. And so the act of heroism, the act of truly authentic freedom, isn't to say I've helped the other person. It's to say I haven't given in to the idea that I will just walk by as everybody else does. Mm -hmm. Because, of course, everybody else is walking by saying, well, somebody will do it. And this is, of course, the opposite of what Zizek's theory of freedom is. If authentic freedom is contingency presented as necessity. In other words, someone accidentally passed out in the street and yet I had to act. I had to be the one person. Then fake freedom or inauthentic freedom is precisely when we have something that is presented to you as authentic choice, as your own freedom to do X. You're your own free agent because you can, you know, be an entrepreneur or you can invest in crypto or you can blah. All of these kinds of we're going to democratize access to some kind of service is the opposite of a free choice. This isn't, well, I'm free because I had to. This is I'm had to. And so I'm going to pretend to be free. In other words, a freedom born out of necessity instead of a freedom that is experienced as necessity. Mm -hmm. And so the condition for an authentic act of freedom from Zizek's perspective, is precisely to experience it as duty. I had to. And the opposite, an inauthentic freedom, is precisely when what is a duty, which is to survive, is presented to you as the only authentic act of your own expression. Mm -hmm. And so we have, perhaps I haven't explained this very elegantly, but we have here two two fundamental things. Now, I want to go back to music for a moment, because that's where we were earlier. We're talking about the way in which romanticism's inner limit leads to modernism. And one of the things is, that I think is very interesting here is Adorno, who is very cranky about most music and <laughs> not just popular music, but like, you know, um, classical music as well, uh, has an interesting idea, which is that he says that the light motif, now the light motif is something that Wagner developed. And the light motif is something that nobody needs a, a degree in classical music or musicology in. Every, anybody knows what a leitmotiv is if you've watched the Star Wars movie. So Star Wars movies, and John Williams does this all the time, employs the idea of a leitmotiv. A leitmotiv is the Imperial March before the Darth troops Vader. come. Yeah. It's, here. Yeah. it's when you hear Darth mm-hmm. Vader before he arrives. Not just 
breathing through his mask, but the theme of Darth Vader or the Imperial March, the dum dum dum, that's a light motif. And Adorno has a critique of the light motif. Adorno says when Wagner created the light motif, it was the beginning of the end. It was the beginning of the commodification of music. In other words, it was the beginning by which music went from being, I don't know, melody or exploration of abstract formulas and Bach, etc., into the idea of something which could be sold, something that signaled its own brand, essentially. Yeah, right? and can I just jump in here? Because I think this is a really good example of what you were talking about with the perceived opposites. Because one of the characteristics of Wagnerian opera is there is no break in the music. So for most opera, it's composed of like arias and recitatives. So there's like a song and then applause and then a song and then a chorus and then a solo. And then it's it's very broken up. Whereas Wagner's music, I mean, it is music for an hour and a half and then that's the end of the act. And so it's very much like a complete sort of like holistic musical immersion. But you're exactly right to say that innovating the notion of the motif mm -hmm. brings about, in a way, shortening the opera, segmenting the opera even further. Yeah, I mean, if you want to make a comparison here, Wagner does something to the symphony that is similar to the game of tennis. Mm. Within the game of tennis, the way in which time is broken down, the way in which dramatic tension is broken down, is that every game has points, 15, 30, love, whatever. But if you're both at love, right, 40, 40, you need to do two points. Is that what it's called? Yeah, love. No, love, no, love is, is when zero. Two, no, 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 love is when two things are the same. 15, love, 30, love, when people have the same score. So if you're at, if you're at deuce, right? Mm -hmm. If yes. you're at deuce, which is 40, 40, you could play infinitely within deuce. Mm -hmm. You could be stuck in a deadlock, which is that that you need to win two points. And so what happens within tennis is that instead of having the orderly sequence of time by which you would have like a 90 minute soccer game or a 12 minute quarter in basketball where the time runs down, time is made to stretch within tennis. And so you can have these epically long or even short sequences where it becomes like this will battle of the wills between two players. And so two points can determine the entire game. Mm -hmm. And this is essentially what Wagner does within the blanket of music that is presented within Wagnerian opera, which is that instead of just saying, well, we're going through the motifs and we're gonna reach here and there's, you know, there's gonna be a, a part that goes up and then down and then it gets all developed. Instead, it's constantly that squeezing and that pulling from within the light motif itself. Mm -hmm. And so this is where Adorno is fundamentally wrong. When Adorno says that the light motif is the beginning of the commodification of music, in a sense, he seems prescient, right? He's predicting what happens with Star Wars, etc. But at the same time, in a very Adornian fashion, he's failing to understand the properly Hegelian dimension within the leitmotif, which is that the leitmotif is precisely cracking open music from within. Instead of saying, let's have silence as the opposite of sound, let's have the sound breaking down within its own barriers within the leitmotif. And this is where Wagner is very clever because Wagner will present sometimes a key moment in the opera you will bring in the wrong light motif. And so suddenly we have like the sword being pulled out of the tree. And instead we have famously like the death of Brunhilde being foreshadowed in the sword, if I remember correctly. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, and this is something that John Williams ironically also does in Star Wars. One of the most beautiful passages of music within John Williams symphonic score is for the, the Clone Wars mm -hmm. in the prequels where we have the love theme between a young Anakin and Padme. And what is the central, like, woven into the love light motif? It's precisely the beginnings of Darth mm. Vader. And so here we have, you have to imagine that listening to Love Across the Stars or whatever it is and the Clone Wars should give you a similar emotional response to people who listen to Wagner, which is here we have the moment that's supposed to be the big heroic moment. Yeah. And yet within that motif, we already have the seed of its own destruction. In other words, that Darth Vader's doom is already within the love. It's not we go from love, purity, towards villainous evil. It's that villainous evil is in the intensity of that love. That's the tragedy of Anakin Skywalker. It's not that he becomes bad. It's that the intensity of Anakin Skywalker's love for Padme is what makes him evil. In other words, that we don't have the opposite of 
good and evil, we have the unity of opposites in which the villainous comes precisely from the overattachment to the good, which of course, I've said this before, is Hegel's theory of evil. Hegel's theory of evil is simply that that which is evil is what sees evil in the world everywhere. In other words, that over-identification with the good equals evil. If you are convinced that you are the one good person fighting evil in the world, you are the evil one. And this is true across history, that some of the worst human atrocities have been committed precisely under the banner of righteous good. This is also one of the beautiful sequences in, I forget what, it's like the writers of Peep Show. They've mm-hmm. got a comedy mm-hmm. sketch series where... They're in the trenches, World War II, and the Nazis are, like, in full get-up, you know what I mean? With, like, skull and bones and eagles, and eagles imperial eagles, and they've got, like, the, the Hugo Boss leather coats. And, like, suddenly the Nazi has, like, this moment of, like, consciousness, you know? This Einsicht, where he looks towards his superior and he says, are we the baddies? <laughs> and it's like, he suddenly pieces together that, like, oh, yeah, Skulls and weapons and imperial eagles and leather coats. Maybe we're the bad guys. And of course, Mm -hmm. evil never recognizes evil within itself. Evil presents itself as righteous good. And that's the that's the Hegelian idea. I made a clip about this on TikTok where I said that Hayao Miyazaki, the animator and director of the Studio Ghibli movies, makes the same argument. He essentially said that his movies have a antagonist, but they don't have a villain. In other words, The purpose of the hero, of the protagonist, isn't to fight evil, but it's to find good. In other words, to find good within that which was perceived perceived to be evil. And that Miyazaki argues, and this is also important to note that Miyazaki is a lifelong leftist Marxist, union organizer, which is also where he met the other great director, um, what's his name, Uh, Pakusan is what he calls Mm -hmm. him. That, anyway, that his argument is that to see the world as a battle between good and evil is itself a kind of evil. And of course, within our culture, we have a narrative that is presented to us, whether it's through Disney movies, whether it's through Marvel movies, which of course now conveniently are the same, (laughs) is precisely this idea of a heroic figure who overcomes an absolute evil. And that's something that within the Hegelian universe would never happen. It would be considered a simplification. This is also why I think it's Bertolt Brecht who says, pity the nation that needs a hero. Because a nation that thinks that its problems are so black and white that they can be solved by one heroic figure is a nation that is in denial about the root cause of its own problems. That's the idea that Brecht has. That to believe in a hero means to believe in a kind of fundamental evil that can only be fought by the hero, Mm -hmm. rather than finding the root cause of what is happening in a society within its own contradictions and disavows, in other words, with the community itself. And this is part of the reactionary core, which is to say that the problem is out there, the problem isn't within. And so the very idea of heroism and the idea of having a kind of like heroic figure who on behalf of the nation can stand up to absolute evil is a kind of evil. And if you go back to the idea of Christ on the cross, what's really important in the New Testament, many people misunderstand this, is that Christ is precisely this kind of extremely non-heroic figure. Christ is not coming from the sky to shoot laser bolts (laughs) at the Romans Romans or the Galatians or whatever. No, he's the hero who shows up to be absolutely decimated in like the first scene. Hmm. And that's the heroism of Christ. It's not having to prove that he can overcome evil. It's that kind of short circuit within the idea of a battle between good and evil that allows for an opening for something genuinely new. That's the break that the New Testament has with the Old Testament. The Old Testament still exists in the level of the logic of the divine and the, the essence and the appearance between the absolute good and the absolute corrupted. And Jesus, the figure of Christ on the cross, is that X-like moment in which we see the inner limit of that world crumbling. In other words, if you look at the Old Testament as romanticism, in which we have a romantic image of the ideal good and the debased low on earth, it's the inner limit within that tension that comes to fruition within the modernism of the New Testament. I am always, I will always argue that the New Testament is more interesting than the Old Testament, precisely because it is almost like the modernist take. It's the extrapolation of the inner limit of the Old Testament from within. That's how you have to see the New Testament. And so what's ironic is that some people say, well, the New Testament is the opposite of the Old Testament. So as soon as we have the New Testament, we should throw out the (laughs) Old Testament with the bathwater. And that's not true. You absolutely have to see them 
as being connected. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I want to briefly, we're, we're getting towards like the end here. Um, my favorite movie, mm. my favorite movie is Once Upon a Time in the West. I mean, one of my favorite movies. And here we see already, to my mind, what is the logical culmination of the leitmotif. Yeah, I was going to say, with a great leitmotif. Although someone mentioned Jaws, which is pretty great, too. That's a good... Jaws, Jaws is good, but Jaws functions differently. Mm -hmm. So Jaws functions on the level of, we've taken all of these societal ills and societal paranoias, and we've put them onto this one figure of the shark. Yes. You, are you trying to get me back on track? No, yeah, a little bit. But it's also, I think it's from, I think that the... Um, the theme from Jaws actually is also in either a Tchaikovsky or a Dvorak symphony. Da -da -da -da. Yeah, I think with Psycho or something. <laughs> as well. It could be. Anyway, Once Upon a Time in the West. So Once Upon a Time in the West has, in a sense, is still very much in the Hegelian universe. So when we talk about the idea of opposition and contradiction within Hegel, it's still ultimately self-contained. In other words, that the universal exception, as Lacan calls it, is stitched back in. The excessive part is re-internalized, which is quite different from Marx. We'll get there eventually. So for Hegel, it's this very process of something succumbing and falling into its own contradiction that creates the retroactive appearance of unity. Abstract philosophy, I know. But it's within Once Upon a Time in the West that we see the perfect example of this. Once Upon a Time, the West has leitmotif, romantic leitmotif, which is, we know what's happening, but there's all, like, you know, the swelling music as the train arrives into the town in the West, romantic spaghetti Western. Although I wonder if spaghetti Western will be politically incorrect eventually, because it's a bit of a derogative way of talking about what is essentially an Italian Western, right? Spaghetti Western simply means Italian Western. It's like, I don't know, it's like calling a Japanese movie like a ramen a ramen western. Like, it's kind of like, it's kind of like a racist stereotype. Spaghetti western. Anyway, so Ennio Morricone, who scores this film, Sergio Leone being the director, um, plays around with the leitmotif. First of all, we have some misdirections. You call them Wagnerian misdirections, which is that we have not a misdirection in the leitmotif. So the leitmotif will present you the image of a villain. Mm -hmm. And yet we hear the music of the villain right before the villain shows up. But of course, who is the villain? It's... Peter Fonda? Peter Fonda. You would never expect it. The person who plays the hero. It's like as if like Captain America... And I America... feel like that doesn't make any sense until it's sort of, yeah, spoilers, but it's sort of like when Captain America, the actor who plays Captain America is the villain in Knives Out. It's this actor who is known for wholesome virtuous characters is suddenly cast as the villain in this movie. And that would be really shocking. And, and not only that, there's like a cinematic misdirection which happens, which is we have this idyllic scene of a farm within... So it's a farm, there's a woman, and she's getting asking her son, who's like a little boy, like six years old, to get water from the well. The romantic music is playing. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, we hear gunshots, and people are being killed mm -hmm. on this idyllic farm, essentially. In fact, one of the children has been shot, if I remember correctly. Mm -hmm. And we look into the weeds, the camera looks into the weeds, and we don't see who the assailant is. Of course, this being a Western, we think, well, it must be, you know, a Native American, or an Indian, etc. It must mm -hmm. be some, or some Mexican, or some kind of, like, image of, like, the other, horrific other, etc. And who comes out of the weeds? It's an extreme close-up of the ultimate action hero, <laughs> who has just done, like, the ultimate taboo on screen. <laughs> Enormous misdirection, and if you're in an audience watching it in a cinema with a sufficiently old enough population, <laughs> you will hear gasps from them. And so here we have a misdirection, which doesn't come from the leitmotif, but it comes from the interplay with the leitmotif within the thematic framing and the anticipation of the story itself. But where, where the properly Hegelian part comes in is, and the only way to understand this is through the German title of the movie. So in Germany, they always have different titles. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they're better titles. So in, in, in America, it's called um, Once Upon a Time in the West. In Germany, the movie's called Spiel mir das Lied vom Tod, which means Play Me the Song of Death, <laughs> which is a much more, like, dark, gothic... <laughs> Evocative. And this is also why, ultimately, if you watch any of Sergio Leone's westerns, um, they... First of all, they're much better than most American Westerns because, like, they're both really dark and gothic, but they're also, like, ironic, and they play with the sacred and the profane. One of the best themes ever is if you go to 
his very last movie, I'm trying to remember what it's called, is called, it's called, uh, something something sucker. I think it's called Boom Sucker, or, like, uh, it's about a guy who's, like, trait yeah. is that he uses dynamite to blow people up, yeah. and he has, like, a line, which is something, like, it's, like, Boom Sucker or something. I don't know, that's not exactly what it is, someone will know. Anyway, the point being, the German title for Once Upon a Time in the West is Spiel mir das Lied vom Tod, which means Play Me the Song of Death. And what happens in Once Upon a Time in the West is that the light motif, the theme song, if you will, although that's not what a light motif is, of the and of the protagonist, of the hero, is a harmonica score. Mm. But it doesn't sound like your typical hero score. Mm-hmm. It's not like da 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 da. <laughs> Instead, it's like this very like kind of spooky theme. Haunting. Yeah. And and our and here's already the first little funny thing. Within Sergio Leone's Once Upon a Time in the West, the hero plays his own light motif. In other words, when the hero shows up, and this is also when I say the sacred and the profane, the high and the low, it's a ridiculous idea. <laughs> like the only, there's a movie that makes fun of this. If you watch Disney's The Emperor's New Groove, <laughs> there's a character called Krunk, who is the henchman of the queen, who in a very comedic sequence is sent on a nighttime stealth mission to assassinate someone or kidnap them. And he plays his own theme. So he's like sneaking through the city at night and he's going, he's like like singing his own theme song. It's a ridiculous idea to take something that would be so comedic and to make it the central passage of your hero. Mm -hmm. So in one point in the time of the West, whenever the hero shows up, he has a harmonica and he plays his own theme music. That's already Sergio Leone's brilliance. I mean, it's totally intentional. Mm Now, what do we find? Everyone's like a little bit like, wait, this is weird. Why is this guy (laughs) playing his own music? Like, because there's the realism of Leone's movies. And at the final confrontation, spoilers for Once Upon a Time in the West, in the final scene of the movie, Unity of Opposites, we have the confrontation between the hero and the villain. And what the hero does is that there's suddenly a flashback. And here we have Sergio Leone imp- implementing what Japanese anime directors do. So the key stylistic device, narrative stylistic device in anime is to slow down time. For example, you could have uh, baseball is very popular in Japan. So in an anime, you could have a pitcher, a batter, sorry, a, ba- a pitcher and a batter. And they would throw the ball. And with the entire episode would happen within the throwing of the ball. Or you could have two characters fighting and they're just looking at each other and the entire episode is like a flashback to why they hate each other so much. Now, from a formal technical perspective, this is simply because it's expensive to animate things in motion. Mm -hmm. And so a cheap way to make mass-produced anime is to simply have two characters looking at each other (laughs) rather than fighting. The, 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 uh, The epitome of this is... Uh, Dragon Ball Z, in which 10 episodes will go by and it's literally just two characters in the air looking at each other and we never actually get there. It's essentially like the violent version of a telenovela because soap operas have the same problem. Soap operas don't have a high budget, so they just need to create the maximum amount of drama with two people just talking to each other. Anyway, so within anime, we have this almost like Louise Borghesian stretching of time. Borges is this famous story where there's a man who's standing in front of the execution squad and the entire short story happens within the trigger being pulled and the bullet hitting his forehead. We have this whole life flashing in front of his eyes, essentially. That's what happens within anime. It's this idea that we have a flashback that stretches time. This is also, I know I digress, this is why Miyazaki of Studio Ghibli perceives himself as a realist filmmaker. He insists that he's a realist. What he means by that is that the passage of time in a Miyazaki movie takes place according to a non-modern, non-stretched linear sequence. Mm -hmm. In fact, one of the things that makes Studio Ghibli movies so enjoyable is precisely that you can bathe in the non-time, the downtime. It's just characters looking into the distance. It's very, very wholesome. Mm -hmm. Anime does the opposite. Anime is properly modernist in that sense. It's constantly manipulating the passage of time for dramatic effect that Miyazaki doesn't do this. Mm -hmm. So even though Miyazaki has fantastical creatures, he perceives himself as a realist filmmaker because of that linear development. Now, to go back to Once Upon a Time in the West, Spiel mir das Lied vom Tod, we have here the final confrontation between the antagonist and the protagonist. 
and the protagonist, having beaten the... Uh, has a flashback, sorry. Mm-hmm. And the flashback is that we see the protagonist as a young boy, and the bandit has come to his town, and he's taken the father of the young boy, and he's strung up the father by his neck on a tree, or not a tree, or whatever, like a beam, and he's made the boy carry the father on his neck. So on essentially, his on his back. And so the, so the boy is holding up the father and preventing him from dying. Exactly. And so the cruel game that the bandit is playing is that when the boy eventually passes out from thirst, his father will die. In other words, he's not just watching the death of his father, he's causing the death of his father. Very dramatic. And at this point, the bandit reaches into his pocket, grabs a harmonica, and stuffs the harmonica in the mouth of the boy. And of course, what happens eventually is that the boy passes out, and his like passing out breath makes the sound, the sound of the harmonica isn't being played, it's the sound of the boy's ragged breath through the harmonica. And here we have the culmination in the most dramatic moment of the movie is the German title of the film. Spiel mir das Lied vom Tod. Play me the song of death. And so now we realize that the motivation that the antagonist had to kill the bandit all along was a revenge plot. It was a revenge plot by which he wanted to take the harmonica, which was the the symphonic expression of his pain, Mm -hmm. and essentially give it back. And so when he defeats the antagonist, he returns the harmonica to his mouth. It's like it's like Japanese anime, basically. It's like the most <laughs> epic culmination of the leitmotif, because here we have the literal formalistic expression of the leitmotif as actual object. In other words, we have here like almost, you know how like in Hitchcock, you have like the Hitchcock objects, the mm-hmm. object around which everything is structured. Sergio Leone did that properly. Sergio Leone has this harmonica which is the object, the materialization of the leitmotif around which all of the action progresses. And what's funny here is that here we have the progression from Hegel to Marx. Here we have the progression from the Hegelian, the notion realizes itself and is perceived opposite, into the properly excessive materialization of Marx. In other words, rather than having something which has an essence that emerges only in its own self-contradiction, we have the excessive material object the harmonica, around which all of the other action and drama and essence unfolds. And that's how we go from Hegel to Marx. Marx simply finds the internal limit within Hegel, which is that it's not just the self-actualization of a notion into like a sublime, uh, not sublime, into a sublimated form of content. Uh, It's the opposite of that almost, which is that there is an excessive, which is what we call indivisible remainder. There's something which cannot be naturally fit into the positive order of being. And it's around that excessive indivisible material remainder that essence unfolds. In other words, that the harmonica is precisely the thing that doesn't need to be there. The harmonica is the thing that fades away. Once the harmonica is placed back into the mouth of the antagonist, the entire sequence sublimates. The harmonica is the material indivisible remainder, the the excessive substance around which the entire human drama unfolds. It cannot be integrated within There is no reason for the harmonica to exist after it's completed its motion. The entire drama is around the harmonica, but the harmonica is external to it. That's the transition from Hegel to Marx, to where Hegel we have unity of opposites, where everything clicks into place. And for Marx, we have this idea that there's an indivisible remainder. There's an excessive material substance around which the essence emerges. Mm -hmm. Now, to go back to Wagner, in Parsifal, we already see this transition in a Hegelian sense. The famous sequence in Parsifal, which is taken from Christ, Christ on the cross, because I'm linking this back up to Christ, is precisely the Wunde heilt nur der Speer, der sie schlug. The wound can only be healed by the spear that stabbed, that him. stabbed it or thrust it or yes. whatever, right? It's yeah. the opening and closing. And within Hegel, this opening and closing is imminent to its own being. Mm-hmm. It's only within Marxism that this opening and closing of the becoming of the or- logical order of being has to be necessarily incomplete. In other words, has to be sustained by an excessive particular material substance. Mm-hmm. Or to go back to Lacan in the beginning, we have this idea that the only universal thing is difference itself. Mm-hmm. That what makes the universal, the symbolic order complete is its own incompleteness. 
And the incompleteness needs to have a material marker. And so the same way that the spear, the spear in Parsifal is that which opens and closes, in Once Upon a Time in the West, we have the harmonica as that which opens and closes. The beginning of the drama is the little boy having the harmonica thrust into his mouth. And the end of the drama is the harmonica being returned to the mouth of the antagonist. Mm -hmm. And so ironically, we don't simply have here in which everything is made good. In the universe of an apology, it's not saying that I have done that which has been done to me, I have now done to you. It's that the entire order of being emerges around the inability to properly close the sequence. Mm -hmm. The father cannot be restored to life. It's ultimately a profoundly empty gesture. There's no heroism in this sequence. There's only retribution. And that's what's and that's what's so perfect is because this musical theme, which we've associated with heroism, mm-hmm. at the most heroic moment, it's precisely when that m- music does not play. We realize that what was presented to us as the leitmotif of the hero is in fact the traumatic object yes. of the villainry that was committed upon him, right. which cannot be made undone. Right. It can only be brought to a to a halt, to a close, the essentially. Can only be closed, yeah. And so this is Sergio Leone's brilliance, and I highly recommend you watch it, which is precisely this like unraveling of the light motif from within. It's mm-hmm. the modernism of the romantic light motif. It's distinctly modern. Everything about the light motif is utilized against its own appearance. Mm-hmm. The heroic light motif is in fact the object of traumatic villainy. The antagonist is presented to us as the hero, all this like Everything about this movie is constantly breaking down, Mm -hmm. and the idea of good and evil presents itself not quite as good and evil. And so it's it's really beautiful, and it's totally different from the moralizing American universe of the Western. This is something I think was Alain Badieu who told Zizek once that like he secretly really likes Western movies, American westerns, because it's so comforting. This notion that here's this (laughs) one lone heroic figure who can come and rescue the town from its own demise. Mm -hmm. This heroic narrative where the where the the hero like goes out into the sunset afterwards, is something that Sergio Leone completely denies. Mm -hmm. Go to the opening sequence of Once Upon a Time in the West. It is the, it's a super famous sequence. It's completely, completely boring. It is Mm non-action. This is what's so fascinating. The first, I think it's like 12 or 17 minutes of Once Upon a Time in the West, or in German, Spiel mir das Lied vom Tod by Sergio Leone, are bandits waiting to rob a train, to have a train heist, mm-hmm. or not even rob a train, they're waiting for the hero who's coming on the train. Yeah. And the beginning of the movie has no dialogue. It's like 15 minutes of nothing. And and everything is captured within that But it's still that super tedium. fascinating. The flies and like, it's just very, it's captivating even though nothing is happening. Yeah. yeah no, no, it's... I don't want to like turn this too much into like a movie thing, but like, <laughs> do yourself a favor if you have time and you're interested in yes. cinema, watch Once Upon a Time in the West, because it'll give you so many ideas to work with, both when it comes to cinema, when it comes to philosophy, etc. Okay, so what is the purpose of this class? The purpose of this class has been to take the Hegelian idea, which appeared to us as very abstract, which was the unity of opposites. The idea that a notion finds its own most purest form in its perceived opposite. Mm -hmm. This is something that we started with. We had a lot of examples, like we had the example of the couple that's playing a game of who do I get to cheat on as a way of expressing their true love. Mm-hmm. We had the idea of the apology, where an apology is, you know, accepted at the by means of saying you didn't have to apologize. We had the idea that within romanticism to modernism, we have the extrapolation of an internal limit rather than two things that are simply opposed. In other words, that we don't have two positive negations, but we have a positive substance that, uh, that emerges from an inner negation. And then I tried to slowly, through a reading and analysis of Once Upon a Time in the West and the idea of the light motif, show you the development from Hegel to Marx. How Marx says, yes, I like this Hegelian idea of the unity of opposites and contradiction, except it's not a completely closed system. There has to be one excessive particular material substance, what she calls an indivisible remainder, around which this movement emerges. But you know, here we have to add one thing. Hmm. Marx himself is not contradicting Hegel. Marx is finding the internal limit within Hegel. Now, why is that? What is the indivisible remainder? What is the material substance within the Hegelian edifice? The properly Marxist harmonica Hmm. sticking in the mouth of the Hegelian (laughs) dialectic. It's the subject. 
It's subjectivity. Remember, in the dialectic of essence and appearance of the absolute and the particular, it's the subject that is the excessive, indivisible remainder. The thing that shouldn't be there, the site of the originating trauma, is the subject, subjectivity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly why for Hegel, essence appears only in appearance as subject. And so Marx is simply taking the internal limit of Hegel, which is that in a Lacanian sense, the subject is the real. It's the bone stuck in the throat of the Hegelian edifice. And Marx, in the transition from the unity of opposites towards the idea of an excessive particular substance, is simply making that argument about Hegel himself. In other words, Marx doesn't say, let's have a material antithesis to Hegel. Marx simply points out the material within the Hegelian edifice himself. Now, this is something. Lacanian psychoanalysis and the idea of the real, Lacanian symbolic imagining real. If you want an introduction to that, that is in my ebook. There's literally two chapters on the Lacanian real and symbolic imagining whatever. He takes that idea and he applies it to Hegel and Marx. Mm -hmm. And he says that this is the transition, the inner limit of Hegel into Marx. And so it's completely fundamentally wrong to think of Marx as writing a retort to Hegel, where he says that, oh, Hegel is this abstract idealist, and now we're going to bring it back down to earth, we're going to make it about political economy, etc. No, no, no. It's that Marx is simply extrapolating the internal limit within Hegel, which is, what is the role of a seemingly excessive subjectivity within the dialectic of essence and appearance? It's the logical conclusion and evolution of that which is already within Hegel. On that note, we've reached the end of this class. Thank you for going on this quote-unquote journey with us <laughs> from Hegel's unity of opposites to the Marx, Marxist idea of the what Lacan calls the universal exception, the particular substance, the particular exception that contains within itself the universal of its own becoming. Very abstract. But hopefully <laughs> along the way you've enjoyed talking about love and romance and dating and movies and music and we've tried to stuff everything we can into this. So... Thank you so much for being with us this morning. Mm -hmm. Thank you for providing me and us with this opportunity to get to share our passion and our joy mm -hmm. when it comes to theory and philosophy with you guys. My sincere hope is that you will find the world to be a more lovable and livable place if you can find this level of passion and excitement in everything around you, whether it's art, whether it's poetry, whether it's theater, whether it's cinema, whether it's anything. I want it to come alive. I want it to spark joy and excitement and intellectual curiosity and passion for you mm -hmm. because that is the only way that I know how to live. And if that is something we can share together, it makes me very happy. Mm -hmm. So thank you guys so much for starting our week in this fashion. Mm -hmm. We're gonna enjoy Seattle. Mm -hmm. Next Monday, we will still be in Seattle. Mm -hmm. So there's that to look forward to. <laughs> um, just a very quick note. If you'd like to support these classes, please consider becoming a patron today. It starts at just $5 a month. It makes a huge difference in terms mm -hmm. of keeping this project open access. That's how we pay for it. That's how we can keep our classes free. Uh, you can also find my ebook there, which Jenlene has very kindly edited, mm -hmm. as well as the transcripts for every lecture so you can catch up. The yeah. ebook provides you with a hopefully enjoyable and easy to read summary of the key ideas and concepts in these classes. So if you really want to get the most out of these mm -hmm. classes and you want to provide us with the financial support to keep the classes free, please become a patron today. All right. Oh, Thanks one for, last thing, Oh, right? yes. One last thing. We're going to be going live on Discord in five yes. minutes for mm -hmm. a Q&A session. We're going to record another 45-minute Q&A, which we do after every class. And we also upload the Q&A as a podcast for our patrons. So if you'd like to become a patron and listen to our Q&A, please go to our, I don't know, link, yes. www.patreon.com. That's Jenlene and Julian. Jenlene and Julian. Jenaline and Julian. Okay. I flubbed that. <laughs> I flubbed the, the link. I, everything else is good. You know where to find this. Thank you guys so much for joining us. Thanks for starting your week with us. We look forward to seeing you same time, same place next week. All right. Thanks, guys. Bye. Bye. Bye.